Welcome to Living Free Today, a ministry of Cornerstone Fellowship in San Lorenzo, California. These podcasts are the weekly sermons of Dr. Michael L. Wilson. Please open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, looking in chapter 8, starting in verse 26. G.K. Chesterton is an apologist for the Christian faith. He is an author. And in one of his apology books, he wrote, When people cease to believe in God, they do not believe in nothing They believe in anything. And he wrote that, and C.S. Lewis actually picked up that book, and in reading that reasoning, C.S. Lewis became a Christian and a great Christian author. And G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis, all these people who go by their initials, were great friends until they both passed away. In our world today, for decades, people have been trying to remove God from what is going on, God from education, God from business, God from school, God from TV and entertainment. And the belief is, if you remove God, that oppressive force, that people will rise up and do the right thing and be good and righteous and holy without God. The difficulty is, as has been said, once you remove God, people don't just say, okay, and don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything, and you see that today as the rise of all the various spiritual forces that are anti-God. Os Guinness is also an author that wrote about Christ's impact on modern culture. And he wrote, early hunters in, on safari in Africa used to build their fires high at night in order to keep away the animals in the bush. But when the fires burned low in the early hours of the morning, they would see all around them the approaching outlined shapes of animals and a ring of encircling eyes in the darkness. When the fire was high, they were far off, but when the fire was low, they approached again. As we have witnessed the erosion and breakdown of the Christian culture in the West, so we have seen the vacuum filled by an upsurge of ideas that would have been unthinkable when the fires of the Christian culture were high. We are in a difficult place in this country, and if you look at Luke chapter 8, Jesus lands at a place on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and he finds the impact, the stronghold of Satan that has never been seen before or since. This miracle of casting the demons out of this person is found in Matthew 8, Mark 5, and Luke 5. It is a profound teaching that needs to be understood. When Jesus Christ walked the earth, we do have a sense that demonic activity was at an all-time high. This sort of possession and impact of demonic activity was not seen in the Old Testament, and it was not seen after the Gospels. After the book of Acts, for example, Paul never once mentions demon possession. Neither do James and Jude and John in the epistles. They never mention that in the book of Revelation. The only one you have that may be demon-possessed is the Antichrist himself, which we believe is possessed by Satan himself, which is why he has all that power and charisma. But the idea that there was a exposure to the demonic world when Jesus was here and it continued or grew after Jesus ascended into heaven is not supported by Scripture, and we have to kind of ask why. 
Throughout the gospel, when Jesus comes against a demon or a demonic force, they always declare his true being. He is the Holy One of God. He is the Holy Son of God. He is God, is basically what they're saying when they uh, say these things. And the you kind of say, well, why is that? Well, he, all the demons were created by Jesus. When they opened their eyes the first time in heaven, before they rebelled, the first person they saw was Jesus Christ. He is their creator, and they understood then who Jesus was and the power he had. And then in the rebellion, and they call it a rebellion because they rebelled against the power of God. They were kicked out of heaven. They came down to earth. And Jesus showed up. If you read the responses of the demon-possessed people, there is also the idea that they were not expecting Jesus. Okay, This is an unexpected visit. They were surprised that he is there, but they still respond properly. If you were to sit down with an angelic person, being and ask them about what they know about history. At this particular time, your demons knew the beginning because they were created in the beginning and they saw how God created the heavens and the earth and animals and people and all that happened from there. And they also know how it's going to end. God has made it clear to angelic beings that the end is God setting up his earthly kingdom again with a new heaven and a new earth. Now that the rest of the New Testament has been written, all the demonic forces know exactly how it's going to end because they have the book of Revelation and they can look at it and they can see their demise. And there seems to be indication that when Jesus walked the earth, they were aware they were going to lose. They were aware they were going to be imprisoned by God forever, and they were just getting as much as they could in the way of their own power and their own adoration and their own control of earthly things until such time. And then Jesus comes and interrupts it. Jesus comes as an, you know, an intermission between creation and revelation. And they do seem surprised when you look at the original Greek. They are using surprise sort of language. They were not expecting it. This was not in the playbook. Okay? And so Jesus comes. And a lot of people will look at this and say, well, the demons are attacking Jesus. But if you look at it the way it is written, Jesus is attacking the kingdom of Satan. Jesus came for two reasons. He came to save people from their sins. And all the rest of the stuff is secondary in relationship to saving people from their sins. Because if Jesus didn't save anybody, he can be a fantastic miracle worker, but you're dying in your sins, there's no point to it. So he saves people from their sins. And the second reason he came was to destroy the strongholds of Satan. And that is what we see In this, and so he shows up in verse 26. Now, how did they get to Gerasenes? Okay, it's a big word there, and you can just sound it out by the vowels. And in 22, last week, we talked about Jesus calming the storm. So they get in the boat. So we're going to go to the other side, about an eight mile journey across the top of the Sea of Galilee. The disciples may not have known exactly the name of the city, but Jesus did. Jesus knew why they were going to the other side. He was going to heal a demon-possessed man. But then the storm hits, and they get all turned around, and they get scared, and they think they're going to perish, and Jesus calms the storm. And I bet if you were to get Peter, James, and John, the fishermen of the group who, who knew how to manage a boat and say, which direction are you pointing? Since it's the middle of the night, they may not have known. But Jesus knew, Jesus knew after he calmed the storm, he said, we're going to go that way. Okay, and they say, okay, we're going to go that way. And they land on a place called Gerasenes. Okay, 
When they land, they are at a place where somebody comes up to them. And it says, if you read the whole thing, that he is a demon-possessed man. It's been a long time. We don't know how long of a time it is, but probably more than a couple days, okay? Probably maybe years that this guy has been doing this, walking around naked, living amongst the tombs. They would try to chain him, and in his demonic strength, he would break the chains, and then the demon would push him out into the desert. So he was a wild man. He lived among the tombs, and I've seen kind of images and people who have drawn this. He was not in a modern cemetery like we have today. There were no uh, headstones. There were no crypts. If you remember how Jesus, what happened to Jesus when he died? They buried him in a tomb. What was the tomb? The tomb was a cave. And they put a big stone in front of the cave that was carved out of the side of the hill. And so you had a a cemetery back then was on the side of a hill. And you would have dozens, if not a hundred of these caves, some natural, some man-made, a lot of sandstone back there, and so they would carve out places where they would put people when they have died. And as we've said before, the way that it works is they take the body, they wrap it in cloth tightly, they put it in a cave, they come back in a year, and everything is decomposed, and all you have is the bones, they take the bones... They put them in a bone box called an ossuary, and then those are stored probably in a back room of the synagogue, just stacked up. And then they would use the cave again. And so he's living amongst caves, and he's living amongst caves within enough uh, distance that he could see this boat of 13 people coming on the land. And he may have thought that, hey, you know, fresh meat, I'm going to go and I'm going to torment these people, maybe even hurt them, maybe even kill them, depending on what the demon was thinking. And so he runs, he runs at full speed toward them, and then he recognizes Jesus. And he falls down on his face, and that is an aspect of worship. That is an aspect, he says in 28, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. He fell down full face out, face down. He was bowing in worship to his creator. Okay, this being who had terrorized everybody on that side of Lake of the Sea of Galilee had recognized who Jesus is, surprised probably by it, And he fell down face before him, and he cried out in a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. And so the the other aspect of this, and it says up in 31, And they begged him not to command them to depart, into the abyss. As you read through the Gospels and as you read through the New Testament and you read through Revelation, there are two basic places, maybe three, where demons can be sent, where Jesus could send them. When we see the word abyss, that reminds us and is probably the bottomless pit. In the book of Revelation, There is a bottomless pit that contains demonic forces. And it is opened after the thousand-year reign, after the millennial kingdom. It is opened and demonic forces are allowed to come out and tempt people. So you ask the question, how do demonic forces get in there? Well, God puts them in there. And one option, and the demons know this option, is that they can be sent into the abyss, into that pit, waiting for the end of time. And they say, please don't do this. They also say, uh, do not torment me. 
The other place that demons can be sent is the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the eternal resting place for all unbelievers and all demonic forces. Okay, they are thrown into that. It is the total absence of the presence of God. And they will be tormented for all of eternity in what the book of Revelation calls the lake of fire. So the demons know these things and they say they don't want it. Now, Jesus is their master. Jesus can do anything he wants to them and they cannot fight back. Jesus is attacking them. They are not attacking Jesus. And so Jesus talks to them and says, So what's your name? And they say, Legion. Most commentators will say Legion is not a name. It is a military designation. The Romans are in power today. And the Romans have large groups of soldiers that are marching around and conquering things and protecting the emperor. And if you have a group that is more than 2,500 and less than 6,000, you call it a legion. A commander would say, that's my legion. And your mind would say, it's several thousand soldiers that he is doing. And so if the demons know this, which we think they, they do, this person has in them 3,000 demons. This person is fully and completely housing 3,000 demons. And when you say, but how do they all fit? Well, demons are spiritual beings. They take up no space. He has 3,000 consciousnesses that are in him, which if you talk about hearing voices, and there are people who, have, who say, I hear voices, most people don't hear 3,000 voices all at once, most people are not being pulled in 3,000 different directions all at once, but that seems to be what is happening here, and because he is driven into the desert and things of this nature, it's possible that there were demons that were vying for authority or power. When Jesus is talking to this demon-possessed man, there does seem to be one voice that is answering him. So there is one dominant demon that Jesus is interacting with. This is the only place in the whole Bible where there is multiple demon possession in one person. We do not know how common it is. It isn't so common that Jesus runs across it every time he turns around, okay? Okay. When Jesus healed the unclean spirits in the synagogue, it was one demonic force and one man. Okay? This is thousands in one guy. And it gave him enough strength to break iron chains to basically fight anybody that comes, and they couldn't subdue him. He was the master of his domain with all these demons that are in him. And so Jesus is telling this person, this being, this demon to get out. These demons to get out and they're saying, don't torment us, don't send us into the abyss. And they say, hey look, bunch of pigs over there. Okay, and that tells us at least one thing. This is Gentile land, okay? Jews would not herd pigs because there's no point to it. They're not allowed to eat bacon. They're not allowed to do anything, use the pig for any purpose whatsoever. And so it is Gentile land. It is a land where they do not have food restrictions. And instead they have pigs. And in the book of Mark, it tells us that there are 2,000 pigs. Okay? Okay. That is a huge, huge mud pile up there, and they're wallowing around. A lot of pigs, and it must be profitable for him to have 2,000 pigs. Other people have said, because the demons went into the pigs, maybe there's 2,000 demons, okay? One pig per demon, 
Um, no way to know. That is just speculation. But they say, how about the pigs? And Jesus, it says in 32, so he gave them permission. They cannot do anything in the presence of Jesus of their own volition. They have no free will in the presence of Jesus. They have rebelled against Jesus. Everything they do, they must ask permission. They don't tell Jesus what they're going to do. They ask. They beg. Jesus has absolute authority over this group of demons. Jesus gave them permission. He says, go ahead. They came out of the man. They went into the pigs. And the pigs ran down the hill and drowned in the Sea of Galilee. Now, I read many commentaries on this miracle. And the general consensus is, this is bizarre. There's no rational reason that we can conceive of, that we can search the scriptures why a demon would like to be inside of a pig for a matter of seconds because we believe that when the pig dies, the demon is released, okay? And the demon gets to go and do something else. It does give them a, a few more seconds, a few more moments of excitement, of, of living in the physical world. Uh, if Jesus sent them to the bottomless pit, then they would be there till the end. If Jesus sends them to the lake of fire, then they're there for all eternity. They're out of the game. And so this may give them a sense of, of freedom to do stuff. And of course, the the wild, wild demons that uh, enter the pigs, the pigs can't take it. And they rush down the steep hill into the Sea of Galilee, and they they drown. In 34, it says, when the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it to the city and the country. Some people have said the herdsmen were angry at Jesus. The Bible does not say that the herdsmen were angry at Jesus. Everybody who saw this whether it be the herdsmen, whether it be the townspeople, whether it be the man who used to be demon-possessed, they're all surprised. They're all amazed. This is unexpected. This is something that they could not have planned for. And so the herdsmen go into town, and they tell the people, and the whole town, it seems, comes out to see what is happening because the If you have a crazy man who can really hurt you around the tombs and your grandmother passes away and you want to have a funeral, you cannot. You have to find another cemetery somewhere else in another town because this crazy person who's going to hurt you is keeping you from burying your family. And if this has been going on for a long time, my guess is that he has been the talk of the town, that everybody who is trying to plan their day plans it by not going near the desert area and not near the tombs because there could be physical harm. He had controlled the behavior by being out of control of the whole town. And so the whole town, the herdsman says, you know, the, 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 the pigs have run in and the guy's clean and all this kind of stuff. And they come out and they find the man sitting dressed, clothed for the first time in years, wearing clothes and sitting at the feet of Jesus. You know, you can imagine him to be wearing a nice suit and tie and sitting in a chair at the feet of Jesus. He was probably wearing a tunic and a robe. But it also says that he would cut himself and he would hurt himself when he had one of these fits. And so in the healing, uh, Jesus healed all of those. This person was fully and completely healed. The the thought that 3,000 demons in his mind would cause him to be crazy, to lose his mind, 
Jesus fixed that. The healing is not only getting rid of the demons, but putting the guy's mind and his body the way that he should be. He was in his right mind. He was speaking complete and full sentences. He was conversing with Jesus. He was not beating anybody up. He was not screaming like a banshee. He was calm. And so the people come out, and they see him, and their first response in verse 37 is they were seized with a great fear. And they tell Jesus, not thank you, not wow, not how did you do it, none of that. Their response was, get away from us. And when you look at that and you say, what did they see to push Jesus away? Throughout the Gospels and the New Testament and even in the Old Testament, when the presence of God is there, people are immediately exposed to their own sin. They knew in an instant who they were. As Gentiles, they didn't even have the temple and and that sort of stuff. They knew who they were in relationship to a most holy and righteous God. And the first response of people who are exposed to their own sin is to push God away, to push Christians away, to get the church out of your neighborhood. One reason the world does not like Christian communities is we remind people of their sinful state. We remind people of who they are before a holy God. And Jesus doesn't argue with them. Jesus doesn't say, you're wrong. Jesus doesn't preach to them. It just says he got in the boat and went back to Capernaum. Now, the person who was demon-possessed ran after Jesus. He wanted to become a disciple. He wanted to get in the boat and go with him which is a proper response. The person is standing there and all these people don't like Jesus because of their sinful state. And here's a righteous and holy God and here's a guy who is now saved. He's going to go after the righteous and holy God. Okay, But Jesus says, nope, you got to go back into town and you got to tell them all that God has done. John MacArthur puts the title on this passage from maniac to missionary, because he went from absolute out of control to someone who is a spokesman for God. And so they got into the boat, and they went back to Capernaum, and they left this one person whose life had been changed by God to be a missionary to those people. Now you're going to see that person, of course, in heaven, And you're going to see probably his family and his household and all who believed in this radical change that had happened. So what do we get from this? We get from this that Jesus has absolute power. Jesus didn't freak out and say, wow, 3,000 demons, I can't handle that. Jesus has absolute power over everything on earth. There is no disease, there is no demon possession, there is no unbelief, there is no situation where Jesus Christ cannot come into it and fix it. He has absolute power over everything on earth. And at the end of time, who's going to be sitting on the throne? It is going to be Jesus Christ. If you look at the book of Revelation, who is making things happen, opening the scroll and all that. It is Jesus Christ who is running the show, and he's running the show here. There is nothing that they could do, the demonic forces, to affect him, to hurt him, to steer him away, to get him going in a different direction. And so the God that we serve is mighty, is all-powerful. I don't have to fear Anything that's here because God is on, well, I'm on God's side. God's not on mine. I'm on God's side. And I am in a path that God has chosen. And I'm in a direction that God has chosen. 
and God is moving me in this direction, and if I am obedient, if I trust and obey, we sing that. I trust, I read this, and I go, huh, kind of weird, but I'll trust it, and I'll obey. I'll be a follower of Jesus every day of my life. Because of the revelation, even though I don't get what the pigs are all about and all that kind of stuff, the revelation that Jesus Christ has absolute authority over every demonic force. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, there is nothing here that we can fear. There is nothing here that will cause us to tremble. Because we are your children, and anything the world throws at us, you are greater than it. You are all-powerful. You are greater than anything that can come against us. Lord, I pray that you would continue to guide us, that you would open doors, that you would clear paths, that we may always be going in the direction that you would have us. We ask all that through the blood of Christ as we ask your blessing. Upon this time together, amen. Cornerstone Fellowship is located at 180 Llewellyn Boulevard, San Lorenzo, California. Our Sunday morning service is at 1045 a.m. Our website is livingfreetoday.org and our phone number is 510-278-2622. May God continue to bless you as you serve your King. God bless.